Well, good evening and welcome to yet another show of a great leadership life. Um, it's, we're in Nairobi time, 7 p.m., and we've got a lovely uh, group of guests tonight. Um, today's talk, today's show is about innovation. And what exactly do we mean by innovation? And uh, that's what Maureen Macharia, Eric Muduri, and Ronald Osumba will be talking to us about tonight. And of course, our host who is a familiar face on your screens, Mr. Wawerun Jaroge. For those watching us live on uh, YouTube and, or Facebook, you can ask your questions or make comments and we can bring them up on screen. We value your contributions. Or you can follow us on uh, our Twitter and Facebook handles, which is Great Leadership Live, the eight being the number eight. Or email us on greatleadership at gmail.com. Waweru, karibu, habariyako. Mzuri sana, how are you doing, Baba? Not bad. It's very informal, huh? Very informal. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, just want to make sure, make sure our guests are comfortable. Yes. <laughs> Sema. Uh, okay, no, I just wanted to get into it. Uh, you know how we tend to love running out of time. So I'm going to jump in very quickly and ask our guests, first of all, to say to our guests, a very big thank you for joining us. Uh, we have made it to episode 13, and we are still going on and having a lot of fun and learning as we go along. So I'd like to ask, and as we start always, with ladies first, Maureen, please introduce yourself very briefly and tell us what you do. Thanks for the welcome, Aweru, and congratulations, guys, for making it to episode 13, uh, even during this period. It, I see innovation uh, has been working for you. So I am Maureen Mashara and I run Spindle Design, which is a design and digital innovation company. We essentially collaborate with different partners in the ecosystem to bring new products and businesses to the African markets. Thank you very much, Maureen. Eric, could you do the same, please? Sure, thanks, Maureen. Uh, thanks for the invite and I'm happy to be here. Um, and again, congratulations on the 13th episode. Um, I'm uh, Eric Muduri. I work for MasterCard Lab uh, based here in Nairobi. Uh, what we do at the lab is we help build new products and solutions, uh, working with various partners. Uh, what we do is we also help de-risk the business by testing those products out. And uh, once we do test them out and they are adopted by the market, we, we hand them over to the business where they're able now to commercialize it. Uh, yeah, and happy, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Eric. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ronald, please introduce yourself and what you do. Thank you for having us, uh, uh, Wawera and Mato. Um, excited to be here. Congratulations again for making it to season 13 and looking forward to even many more. Um, like you said, my name is Ronald Osumba, and uh, I'm founder and uh, CEO of iGov Africa. What iGov Africa does is really it's an innovation house that works with um, innovators and ecosystem players to support government in more efficient delivery of public services. So, you know, through consultancy, financing of innovators, uh, creating platforms for ecosystem to engage uh, with government, with development partners, and with civil society. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. A pleasure to have you here. Um, Martin, I believe we're going to kick off the show slightly differently. Uh, yeah. And then we'll come and ask the questions to our guests. I'm waiting. I'm raring to go. I'd like to see what uh, what we're going to get out of this, especially our viewers. I know they're going to get a lot out of this, uh, this, this show today. OK, here, let's have a look at that. What, what is the wish? Life is made up of dots. Many, in fact most people, believe that the dots they see every day are all the dots there are. So life goes along according to these known dots. Decisions and solutions are based on these commonly known dots, as well as many conclusions too. Some companies build their entire businesses on these known dots, known as the status quo, business as usual. Then one day, someone comes along and sees one or more dots beyond the commonly agreed upon dots. Dots that others missed, dots that are ignored, dots that others have long since forgotten about. Some like these new dots and celebrate this new discovery. Liking how things currently are and comfortable with everyday dots. Some protest these new dots. Some even claim they are invalid or worse, 
are imaginary dots that don't even exist. Yet, it's these new dots that potentially change everything. What is the source of these new dots? Notions. Unexpected connections. Ideas. Possibilities. And imagination. Fire was one of these dots. So was the wheel. And the bicycle. And the automobile. And the computer. As well as the internet, the smartphone, and the tablet. In fact, many of today's common dots were at one time uncommon, newly introduced dots. So what is innovation? Those other dots, the ones others miss. And having the certainty to know that the dots you see are not only valid, but necessary if the world is to move forward. Today, I'm the one who got my mic muted. Imagine, um, so I'm saying that you have it, a, a brief overview of what innovation is, uh, but I'd like to get it from a definition or personal introduction from our guests. I'm going to start with Eric. Would you agree with the whole aspect of dots, or what would you add to it in terms of your experience of what innovation is? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I, I'd just like to add to what the, the video has talked about already is uh, when you get stuck into BAU or business as usual, um, there are people who tend to identify uh, what we call pain points. So they find out uh, what are the customers more or less suffering from or what are they not happy about, and they provide a solution to that. And uh, the thing is, when you get stuck in that uh, BAU process, you think everything is going well, yet uh, if you're not engaging your consumer or your customer, then that's where you get caught out. So. I think the key learning there is, one, uh, keep in touch with your customer. And wherever you see these are pain points, uh, invest in time and resources to more or less provide a solution to that pain point for your customer. Or, or someone else will actually do it for you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Ronald, do you want to jump in there? I know there's going to be some overlaps here and there, but uh, we'll, we'll make it through. There's some things that we will get from this. And like I said, some are going to overlap. Indeed, indeed. Um, I think I think it's a good description of what um, innovation is. Really, if you think about it, it's about um, you know consistently and continuously organizations looking at how they improve um, user experience with their products and how this uh, makes it more efficient, more valuable, and impactful to the user. Um, so yes, so always constantly connecting all these dots that makes you competitive, that keeps you in front. Uh, ahead of the of the consumer, actually, um, and innovation really is 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 about that. It's about rethinking, reimagining the use of your product and making it better, uh, and just being ahead of the curve. Okay, thanks, Ronald. Um, Maureen, I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you the same thing in terms of the definition, but I also then a follow up question to you: is how do you then approach innovation? Yeah, so I mean, I think when we talk about innovation, it's, it's truly a confusing buzzword in our time, which many people really love to hate. Every business leader agrees that it's important, but no one can uh, seem to agree on what it actually means or what it is. But we, we can agree on certain approaches and fundamentals. If you ask Google itself, it can't give you a definition. Even the very video we've watched is talking about you know, connecting of dots. So the way that we frame uh, innovation at Spinning Design and through the work that we do is thinking about turning an idea into a solution that adds value in the market and from a market perspective. It's executing on a great idea brilliantly. And the reason that we like this definition is because it gives a sense of bias towards action. Uh, one mistake that a lot of people make is talking about being an innovative company or an innovative team where the past in the market, we are doing things that nobody else has ever done. And oftentimes that comes without the impetus to actually roll up our sleeves and do the work of becoming an innovative company. 
because innovation doesn't just happen. Uh, someone has to catalyze the process by leveraging a, a certain set of processes and structures. So to your second question, our approach at, at Spindle is to approach um, innovation, whether that's for a product or for a service or for a business from a human-centered perspective. And so we leverage uh, design thinking to first begin by understanding, okay, so you have an idea, great. Ideas are cheap, there are, there are a dime a dozen, anyone and everyone has an idea. But once you have an idea, uh, taking it through a frame framework of really validating, is this an idea that is worth building in the actual market? Is it uh, viable? Is it feasible? Uh, does it have a strong business uh, model or a, a strong business sense behind it? And uh, testing our ideas with actual users or with the actual markets and making sure that we are constantly iterating and bringing those insights back into our innovation process, so to speak. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Uh, Ronald, I'm gonna come back to you and ask this question. How do you then succeed in innovation? Well, that's a hard question. Um, and innovation is really, I think, largely driven by personalities. So it's about being able to have that acumen to be able to understand um, um, environments, understand consumer behavior, understand how this links into developing a solution that addresses, you know, very specific problems while being innovative, therefore meaning bringing in a new use, bringing in a new process, but at the same time also understanding how to build strong business cases for new innovations. Um, so in a sense, it's not easy. Um, <clears throat> there are very few innovators. There are more inventors than there are innovators because the innovator has to think end to end. You have to think problem, you have to think use, you have to think product, you have to think uh, business environment. Okay, uh, you've just triggered something else. I'm gonna ask this question to Eric. Uh, what's the relationship between innovation and invention? So for invention, the look at it is, it's more or less creating uh, a totally new product um, or a new idea, right? So if you take a look, for example, the invention of the bulb that has led into uh, in innovation around lighting to the point where, for example, you, you can see the kind of uh, creative lighting you can see at the UAP building in, town, in Upper Hill and so forth. Um, companies like Philips have moved on to develop a lot of unique uh, lighting capabilities just from that one invention, right? So I think invention is that uh, creating that new idea, which and then innovation more or less is reiterating that or repurposing that to provide for very new use cases or uh, yeah, use cases in terms of how uh, customers or a business wants to use that uh, idea. So it's uh, an invention I would say is yeah. So the new idea, the new, it's have something totally new, but innovation is more or less uh, reiterating and repurposing it for various and different use cases. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Maureen, um, same relationship kind of question, but what's the relationship between innovation and creativity? <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a general, I guess we can begin even by busting myths that in order to be innovative, you need to be like a, a certain type of person. Like we talk about creatives and how creatives are the ones that, I guess, quote unquote, push innovation in organizations. Uh, but the, the the relationship there is really around thinking around ideas and being able to validate them and anybody can develop that skill and it is a skill set it's something that a person can learn some person can be taught and there are processes that help to facilitate that to you know become a little smoother and more efficient okay um eric you wanted to add something yeah yeah, I just want to take you a few steps back just on what uh, Maureen talked about around design thinking. Um, I, th I think it's a very effective uh, method of doing it. One, because it's human-centered. And there's a whole process towards it whereby, I mean, you start from the ideation process and you develop like a funnel of so many ideas. 
And then now you more or less start validating and seeing what actually makes sense. And this is done again through uh, not just uh, in a room, but you also end up going to uh, to the actual customer and actually testing these ideas out. And what you end up realizing is probably out of a funnel of even 100, you end up going down to say even 20. And then now you move from those 20 and develop what you, like a prototype where you can actually now, if it's an app, if it's a process, and uh, again, now go back and do concept testing with the customer and you're able to get feedback on whether, for example, like what Ronald was talking about, user experience, does the flow work, um, does the engagement with the app or the, or the product make sense? Uh, you can be able to get feedback, uh, one that will uh, add to your either your development of the product you're putting together or even the process that could even end up touching on your commercials. So the design thinking process, I think, is very is something that adds a lot of value to the process of innovation. Thanks, Eric. And I, th I think that's answered a question I was going to ask Ronald in terms of how does one measure innovative strength? Um, I think Eric touched on the fact that you have yeah, a, a funnel, you funnel about 100 down to 20, but um, I just want to find out whether you can expand more, a bit more in terms of how you measure innovative strength. Um, I think the best way to, to, to measure innovative strength is um, consumer uptake, um, if, if you get to this. I think that's the real measure of success for any innovation so uh, you know and i know that this craze about everybody and, and you know just back to what maureen can, was talking about everybody can innovate um i'm always very cautious to 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 guide um you know innovators uh, about why they're innovating uh, we don't innovate for the sake of innovating we innovate to impact people's lives and the true measure of that impact is if there's uptake and if there's use of your product. And therefore, um, um, most importantly, and I guess Eric also touched on this, is making sure that you're constantly in touch with your user and you're constantly testing the impact it's going to have on the users. Um, so when you're going through this design thinking uh, theory, you know, um, having the user at the center of your innovation is extremely critical so what what is called human-centered design uh, by ensuring you have various iterations of your product because you're in constant um, uh, touch and you're in constant test phase with the users so i suppose that, that, that that's my view on that particular issue thanks ronald and then obviously there's the aspect of uh, while you're going through that process, what are the pitfalls or what mistakes can you actually make when it comes to innovation? Uh, Maureen, I'd like you to take that, please. So many. I think there are a couple that touch on the process, there are a couple that touch on the culture, and then there's a couple that touch on like the approach. So one, um, I'd say top of mind is thinking of, uh, in thinking about the value of innovation around a product or technology. Uh, but oftentimes innovation you know is bigger than just a product or a platform and in in fact we tend to say that great leaders don't innovate the product they innovate the, the the factory because then that gives you a consistent supply of innovative products and i think even just from a mindset uh, perspective that's something more of us need to need to take up the other is really around our language we need to stop calling every everything a breakthrough or disruptive, especially things that are, you know, internal company discussions. It's it's okay to have, you know, a balanced pipeline of really big ideas and some others that are smaller ideas. Uh, but if we demand uh, that the smaller ideas are not as breakthrough, we relegate them to a certain sense of lack of importance. So one of the things we absolutely have to think about changing is our language when, when we talk about innovation, because it does matter. Uh, calling small ideas not breakthrough stifles that sense of, you know, wanting to recreate and wanting to push the boundaries and wanting to see what else is, is out there. The other thing that I, I see a lot of companies lacking is, you know, focus in terms of the discussions around innovation. And Ronald has just mentioned uh, that working with innovators, you have to anchor on, on your why. Why are you actually innovating? Because if we don't have a sense of that, we end up creating more and more meaningless products for absolutely reason, the wrong reasons that we ourselves do not understand. 
And it's very easy for a market that is receiving those products to say that, to see and say that, hey, um, there isn't really a, a strong sense of why and a strong anchoring of focus for some of the products that we have. I, I think the last thing from an organizational perspective is culture. Culture eats innovation for breakfast and twice on Sundays. That's that's just a fact. Mm. Look at um, a number of corporates, even in the Kenyan scene, that have, uh, I guess, been disrupted by smaller startups because the culture of innovation doesn't exist. Uh, we sit in our lovely boardrooms and in meetings such as this, and we decide <laughs> this is what our market wants instead of having a culture of, you know, listening to our employees as they listen to the market and feeding those insights through the organization. Thanks, Maureen. A very aptly answered question. Uh, it actually covers what I was going to ask, which is why why isn't it one size fits all when we're looking to innovate? And you've answered that, actually. So I'm going to come back to Eric and ask this question. Um, how is innovation used as a tool by entrepreneurs? I think it can be used in, in different ways. I th just going back to the, the point that um, Maureen mentioned. As an entrepreneur, you need to identify your why or your purpose or what it is that you're trying to solve. Um, some some entrepreneurs may be looking to solve a process. Some entrepreneurs may be looking to solve a product that probably doesn't exist in the market. So you need to understand, or rather, the, uh, once you have that very clear, then from there, you're able to decide what is the tool that I require uh, to help me achieve that. So if it's to simplify a process, there are so many um, uh, tools or uh, solutions out there from a technology standpoint that they could look at. Uh, if, for example, they want to go for the high-end, say, ERP systems, maybe they're too expensive, then they look at, can I now develop my own that is localized for, uh, for the Kenyan market? Like recently, I saw a startup recently got some funding from uh, venture capitalists for developing a HR solution that is locally, uh, it's more or less tailored to the local market. So mm -hmm. for them, they've identified what they are trying to solve and they've been able to identify what is the, the market that they are looking at. That way they know what kind of tools they require. Uh, and then to that point also, there are a lot, there's a lot of um, support that given to the ecosystem uh, by big organizations like uh, MasterCard, where I work, uh, the likes of Microsoft, uh, and so forth, that enable the entrepreneurs to build the solutions that they're looking for. So again, they also need to understand or learn who are the ecosystem players that can support them uh, to be able to build the solutions or uh, solve for the problem that they're looking for. So I think it's it's not something that they can look, that is looked for in isolation. Uh, both macro and micro uh, situations need to be looked at. Uh, know who are the players, who are the 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 people who will support you build that solution or take it to market. Uh, identifying your partners again is really important because uh, you can build a, a solution or innovate uh, something, but you need someone who will help you sell it to the customer. So partnerships again are very important. So that's something I'm, we have seen also. Uh, I've seen in my in my exp in my in my exp in my work career. Uh, we've had to even have um, like a orchestration of partners where you're about three four partners to take a new innovation or a new idea to the market. So it requires also a lot of give and take as well and flexibility from the entrepreneur. Because uh, also, uh, as much as the big corporates are, uh, the big organizations or MNCs are taking them to the market, they've had to realize to work with small uh, entrepreneurs or startups, a lot of flexibility is required to be able to, to do that because they're the ones who actually understand uh, the local market. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to come back to some questions. One is going to regard uh, intellectual property. The other one I'm also going to ask is, what does it cost to actually end up doing all these tests for these models? Um, but I'm going to start with Ronald first, very quickly, and ask, what are the most common myths about innovators and innovation? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and unfortunately now, because, you know, all this, you know, uh, digital companies that are coming up and, you know, becoming uh, IPO stars overnight, um, people have gotten excited about innovation and, you know, there's all these myths that are coming up about innovation. Um, first and foremost, I think the biggest myth is that if you innovate, you make a lot of money quickly. 
um, is a lie. Um, the journey to uh, having a successful product in the market is extremely uh, painful. A lot of these innovators uh, have built, failed, built, failed, uh, burnt a lot of money. Um, if you think about our local example here of Twitter and how much pain um, Peter and Jonjo and uh, Grant Brook had to go through before they finally met their success. I mean, you know, it, it's not an overnight, it's not an overnight thing, you don't have overnight success. The other thing is innovation is all about the newest thing. Uh, the truth of the matter is innovation is largely incremental. So it's not always, you know, I woke up, I got this light bulb moment and I built this thing. By the time the user is getting to use it, like I had mentioned earlier, you've gone through various iterations. It's probably lasted, taken you three, four years uh, before you get, um, you know, a big uh, step change that can actually be taken up in the market. Um, again, there's a lot of um, uh, myths around uh, innovation not being able to be taught. Well, you can't teach it like math or English, and I think Maureen has been doing this already. But there are programs, there are programs that take innovators through uh, the process of, um, um, you know, tapping into their natural curiosity to address uh, existing problems. And therefore, you can teach people how to harness that curiosity, but also just, you know, the concept of uh, building and developing strong business cases. Um, a lot of people also a lot say that innovation, you know, can be done in your bedroom. I hear us telling young people this, you know, a lot of young people are innovating just in their bedrooms uh, with a laptop. It is a lie. You, you know, <laughs> innovation is very creative activity. And this is why people like Maureen exist. This is why uh, labs like uh, MasterCard exist, to be able to bring people together, to collaborate. And, um, you know, people have different perspectives of what your solution looks like and what, they, the, what the market uh, uh, wants. And for big corporations, and I was lucky, you know, with Eric here to have worked in Safaricom where they have a git process for all innovations. And the biggest lesson I learned from that was that innovation is not top down. It's not the CEO sitting somewhere and saying, let's innovate around this. It is probable that a lot of innovations in new companies actually came from the shop floor. You know, somebody thought about it. Somebody was probably already doing it. Um, 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 for the longest time before management realized, oh, this thing actually works. Let's build it into something that is um, um, company-wide. And there's many. I mean, we can go through a list of about 100 myths out there. Yeah. But I think the big lesson here is, you know, if you consider yourself an innovator and you want to go into the space, learn what is and what is not factual. Okay, um, I was gonna say that's something I, want, I wanted to find out. But you know what you've said about it might not, it might not it's not necessarily top down. The top is one who always takes the credit though. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we paid for it. Yeah. 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 So, I'd okay. just like to add to something that um, sure that uh, Ronald has said around the, the mm. getting process. So. Even at the lab, we have something similar. So I think probably it's also available. It, it's, that happens in other companies. And you realize the innovation process factors in so many uh, aspects. So, I mean, you have your legal teams. Again, when it comes to innovation, uh, issues like data privacy are really becoming a major factor. And with a lot of innovation going around the whole digital transformation path, uh, I think innovators or entrepreneurs in that space uh it's something that they really need to look at around the data privacy uh depending on the markets they're going for because it determines what data you can you can get what data you can be able to analyze uh who holds who stores that data and where it is stored um and governments are becoming very uh, uh sensitive in terms of making sure that their data uh, local data is not held in other countries for, for, for obvious reasons so i think the data privacy piece is something that uh is an area that uh the around the innovation space is something that needs to be look, uh, looked at very carefully especially someone who is looking at uh using technology uh around to do innovation mm. okay uh maureen you want to add anything there because i was also going to ask a question about intellectual property because for creative ideas obviously if you go and steal the logo or the tagline for i don't know 
Mazda, BMW, Toyota, and everything, then you're gonna have you're gonna be slapped with something for not you know for stealing intellectual property rights. Um, yes. Innovation, how does it work with innovation though? So I think our ecosystem is yet to mature in in this in terms of being able to protect different IP. And there's actually things that you like you can't attach IP to various things like an idea. And and I usually tell people ideas are cheaper. Where you will <laughs> that is on execution so if the mm. only thing that you have in your pocket is an idea guess what that is not incredibly special i i, I know that might sign, sound a bit harsh but it's it's a high time that we became real with really what is on the table and its value the 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 value seems to be when you take that idea and uh it it becomes something that an external person can consume which means uh, execution so when it comes to IP in, in Kenya, we've had stories of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, hackathons and these challenges happening and some company is said to have come in and swoop, swooped in and stolen different ideas and entrepreneurs are sad, etc. But the reality of some of these situations is, yes, it does happen and there are companies that um, are known for uh, using some of these mechanisms as a pipeline to build some of their own products. Uh, but in, in other cases, it's something that another person has thought of and we ourselves not moving past the idea stage means we can't protect ourselves with IP. Um, we, we can't do copyrights, we can't do trademarks. And then we need also need to think about the enforceability versus the cost. Some of these um, IP vehicles cost a lot of money and cost a lot of time. So it's a trade-off. Are you going to spend or wait until it's enforceable and your idea or whatever it is is protectable, or are you going to figure out a way to, you know, craft for yourself a strong value proposition and a unique competitive advantage in the market, and then think about some of the other legal mechanisms to, to protect your company. Um, so for me personally, I prefer the latter. Um, let's have this idea, let's validate it in the market, let's test it, let's ensure it has a strong business model, and then let's think about uh, additional protections as, alongside that process rather than, oh, hey, I have an idea. Let's IP it. That's uh, mm. not particularly useful. In, in my in my opinion, uh, Eric and Ronald have a different perspective. The lady has run it to the boys. <laughs> Ronald, you go. <laughs> okay let's let's watch something let's watch a new innovation stuff i think what, what, I, what i would say around ip is uh i would advise um people to get legal and get a professional to advise them um because like, like like you said like an idea you can't really protect an idea until you've more or less started an implementation or um, where there's issue of source code. So it, it's really important to have um, a professional give them advice on how to protect the IP. Uh, I believe in Kenya there is an organization that helps people register trademarks and so forth. But it, uh, my advice would be get a professional to, to get guidance on how to go around that. Thanks, Eric. Um, Martin, we have a video, don't we? Um, and yes. will segue, it will segue nicely into the second part of what I want to then, you know, like we, the way we like to say, we're going to shift gears. Um, so this would be a nice way to shift gears after the video. All right. right, there we go. Five months into the pandemic, and while some businesses are struggling to stay afloat, others have found new opportunities. I'm Emily Canal. This is Inc. Innovators. Startups that created technology and inventions before the pandemic are finding their products have become even more useful in the COVID-19 era. Here are three of the innovations that are meeting new demands today. In late January, entrepreneur Gunnar Lyslow mobilized his company to prepare for the coronavirus's arrival to the U.S. He's the founder of Surfaceye, which makes an automated surface disinfection system. Surfaceye's Helio system looks like a standing fan and uses UVC radiation to kill germs on surfaces. Launched in 2010, Surfaceye's products were primarily used by hospitals before the pandemic to prevent healthcare-associated infections. Now, customers include restaurants, hotels, and tourist attractions, including Seattle's Space Needle. 
Surface size revenue between January and July grew more than 350% year over year. When Susan Thompson launched her portable female urinal, Sandy Girl, in 2019, she marketed it as a sanitary tool for campers and music festival attendees. After the pandemic hit, Sandy Girl's sales dropped by about 60% year over year between January and April. To keep her company afloat, Thompson began focusing on women who didn't want to use or couldn't use public restrooms. She modified Sandy Girl's marketing on social media, Amazon, and her own website. So far, her strategy has worked. Sandy Girl booked about $40,000 in sales between May and June, equal to Thompson's full year sales in 2019. Proxy is a touchless technology that lets users open doors and unlock offices with a digital identity signal sent from a smartphone. Dennis Mars and Simon Ratner launched Proxy in 2016. It started selling to commercial real estate companies setting up large offices with employee access. Now, sales are rising in the pandemic as businesses look for ways to stop the spread of COVID-19. Today, the company sees opportunity in smaller workforces. Additionally, Proxy staff is coming up with ways to add contact tracing and health monitoring systems. Mars expects to roll out the service later this year. That's it for this week. Stay safe and share your favorite companies that are finding new opportunities right now. Every day, you use a number of tools to communicate with go. your clients. So that's the aspect of um, how the pandemic has actually then either accelerated or used innovations that have come up from the past, which can be applied now. Um, and this shift of gear that I wanted to go to actually relates to COVID-19. I'll let you comment on what you've seen uh, or add on to what you've seen. But my question specifically is this. COVID-19 has actually seen the prominence or emergence of open innovation, right? My question is this, and for our viewers to want to know, what is open innovation? And I'd like to ask Ronald that question. Um, good question. And, and, and so let me just say first, I think COVID, with all its downside, you know, and has affected a lot of people, um, it has crushed a lot of businesses. Um, it has put a stop to a lot of innovations that were in the pipeline, has also made, you know, presented a new opportunity for for people particularly who call themselves innovators and how to pivot on either existing uh, products or existing processes to address some of the challenges that uh, COVID has thrown our way, whether they're health challenges, economic, logistic, travel, um, etc. So, um, you know, it's just, I think, uh, and we've seen quite a lot of these innovations coming up. In terms of open, open, open innovation, I think the basic, the basic question here is, should be around digital infrastructure and how we look at digital infrastructure as a service. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, government government builds roads or hospitals for the communal use of everybody, and this is then um, where we at least players in the in the sector are saying need to go and once we start talking about how do we develop digital infrastructure that allows more players to come on board to uh, collaboratively build stuff that are impacting people's lives then we start speaking open everything open data open internet open vpns open apis and open um open innovation where people collaboratively build. So if you look at something like GitHub, uh, which allows developers to, you know, dump in their code and they collaboratively are able to build stuff that are impacting people's lives, that's open data, that's open innovation. And so we need then, I think, you know, just going back to the converse, to the myth that we were talking about, uh, that yes. innovation is a solo act. Um, the way to address that is actually through open, open innovation that allows collaborative, collaboratively building solutions that are truly impactful on people's lives. Thank you so much, Ronald. Um, I'm gonna jump to Eric and ask this question then. What, we've talked about open innovation um, and there's something I came across which was interesting is uh, the aspect of reverse innovation. Uh, what actually is reverse innovation and why is it important for developing countries? Sorry, Eric, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah, so I mean, reverse innovation is mostly whereby 
multinationals or large companies ca- go to emerging markets and they build uh, solutions uh, for those markets. And they, they take those learnings to uh, the developed market so that they can be able to uh, amplify their product development process uh, for the Western markets. I think one of the key where we can be able to develop or rather we can benefit is uh, from all the resources that are brought uh, to the region. Uh, we can be able, a lot of these companies uh, have started uh, what I call like incubation, uh, the support incubation uh, companies. Uh, they support uh, uh, processes whereby they can be able to learn from the ground up uh, what the market wants. And they, then they're able to put their resources, technologically, uh, budgets, uh, to develop those products and provide them to 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 the local markets, I think one of the ways, one other other way we can benefit from that is the startups in the region to work very closely with such organizations that are trying to uh, to leverage that kind of uh, process, uh, so that one they're able to get the knowledge transfer, the development tools like the I mean the GitHub that we talked about where all of this code is put in, we can I be able to learn a lot. Everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, learn from the developers in other countries oh, no, uh, so that they can be able to enhance whatever products that we're putting together. So I think that's one. Um, then I just, just, uh, I just saw a comment which I'll probably just want to touch on around the gating process. Just to take you a few steps back. I'm well, sorry about that. Um, uh, so someone was talking about how the, whether you can explain the gating process better for SMEs. Now, more or less a getting process, what it entails is uh, t- from an ideation stage, you move to, you're able to, like I talked about, reduce the funnel by talking to customers uh, to understand whether this is a product that makes sense. Then the getting process now is where you now go to all stakeholders within organization. So you have your legal teams, you have your finance teams, you have your uh, pricing teams, you have your marketing teams, uh, you have your... Uh, uh, operate on your, your technical uh, teams and having a conversation with them and more or less laying out how that product or solution is going to work, who are the partners you're working with, uh, if there are any technical integrations, explaining that architecture and explaining the data flows and the, the, the touch points, uh, talk going into the commercials, how is the business going to make money? Uh, what is the business model or commercial model they are looking at. And once you analyze all that, you're able to, all the different parts of the business are able to, one, give input to help to make it better, or even uh, give feedback on areas that are, that, are, that are working well. And what that process does is it just shows you your readiness for the market. And if there are areas that probably you need to go and tweak, then you can go back again and, and develop that more and make it better. So I think for, from an SME perspective, for even the SMEs in Kenya, uh, it will not be as elaborate probably as or as uh, the big multinationals, but going through that process within your own organization and probably the partners you're working with will help you determine whether you are ready for the market and whether there's any other changes that you need to make because you're getting input from, uh, again, diversity is, is important. Uh, the more I, the more feedback you get from people who are looking at things differently, then the better you are, you can be able to be ready. Okay, thanks, Eric. Now we've looked at open innovation. We've talked about reverse innovation. Hey, okay, one of those days. Um, so, Maureen, I want to come back to you and ask: What is accidental innovation? Accidental innovation is in the name. It's a whoops moment, but that actually works out. Um, so there are like we say, most innovations, most innovations are painstakingly created through, you know, rigorous testing, talking to your users, you know, the human centered or the design thinking process of experimenting, iterating. But some are actually just, you know, simply accidents where an innovator was trying to do one thing and ended up stumbling upon something else. And some of the innovations or some of the things that we have today were accidental innovations. For example, like the microwave. Um, the guy who worked on it, uh, I think he's called uh, Percy Spencer. He was working on uh, um, an emitting magnetron when he realized that the thing that he was trying to fix actually melted a chocolate bar in his pocket. And he, and he said that now he can apply that to, to foods, to heating foods. The pacemaker for hearts 
it was initially a, a, a resistor out of the box and a circuit failed and that meant that he saw a certain signal and it's, he saw that it mimicked a heartbeat. Um, some, something like Slack that we, a lot of us now in the digital age are using for our team collaboration was actually a component of a game that Stuart Butterfield found uh, to have useful, to have a use in, in connecting people and communication and people could sh uh, begin having conversations and then sharing documents. Those are all examples of, you know, something that someone was, was you know, building something else. For, like in the example of Slack, they were building a different tool, a, a, like a game, something that was a lot more interactive. And then they stumbled upon this, you know, community feature and turned it into the product that we all have now. Um, yeah, and, but very importantly, and, and you know, Maureen has described it, I guess, extremely well. Um, but very importantly, in that oops moment, you must then recognize the new opportunity. So a lot of people actually, you know, build one thing, it fails, it's something else, and they never see the opportunity for using that something else. So all these accidental innovations call on the innovator to also have that instinct Mm. to then say oh wait hang on a minute it's, it's not what i wanted to build but it can do this so i guess that opportunistic mind also um, um needs to be very alive yeah absolutely and I, I would add on that um a lot of us as innovators entrepreneurs even large companies sometimes that we work with end up having uh you're not actually measuring what you're doing. You're not keeping track of what's working and what's not. There are no metrics. There's, mm -hmm. there's no data. So even when something works by oops, you have no idea because you're not collecting any information about the direction that your product or your, in your, your service or your business is actually heading in. And that means that we are missing, uh, to Ronald's point, I guess, these serendipitous moments to see, oops, okay, I see a lot of, uh, traction on this and so then pivoting to that line and and you know and <laughs> i wouldn't have used that word said a bit said it said it, whatever you call it um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but just to speak to that and and in terms of just documenting process documenting what works what fails um we have a lot of challenge particularly when it comes to ip and i know we touched on this a little bit on the issue of ip and saying and by the way, I think you, you really need to go through the rigorous process of IP only if it gives you competitive advantage. Not every innovation needs an IP. But if it will give you an, an innovative edge, uh, um, competitive edge, then you absolutely need to go for it. But if you go for it, then all these oops moments need to be captured because the documentation for getting IP is extremely rigorous. And you need to then be able to explain because IP basically you're saying Wawera well, Jiroge cannot ever, ever, ever come up with anything like this. But for us to be able to get there, you then need to be able to define process, to define, um, you know, to capture the uh, documented uh, development. What is it we are, we, are, we, are, we are patenting? It is that particular code, that particular process. So you have to be very clear, you know, just to be documenting as you go along. Fantastic. Uh, Eric, I want to bring you in. These two have just been bantering back and forth with each other. It's okay. Um, Sorry, but, at some point. <laughs> no, Pole, Pole, welcome back. Um, I'd like to ask you this, Eric. Uh, which market industries in Kenya are the most challenging to innovate? Well, I, I don't have a direct answer to that question. What, what, what I would say is... Um, when, when, the, when someone looks at uh, the pain point, you, you have to start from solving a problem, right? Uh, once you're able to identify what that problem is, uh, more or less now map out what it takes to actually uh, innovate around that solution, that problem that you want to solve for. Uh, but, but so, I mean, if you look at, for example, um, agriculture, we've had successes like Trigger where they've identified their niche and they've more or less gone into the whole uh, distribution process by doing that online, by enabling the the farmer and the mamamboga to benefit from their model by making more money out of that. Um, 
if you look at uh, insur insurance, um, right now there are quite a number of companies that are doing a lot of work in the insurance space. Um, insurance being, I would say, is a bit challenging as regards to uh, the, the penetration of insurance is probably about three five percent in the in the country. So the, the I would say the challenging piece maybe comes from an adoption point of view in the industry that uh, you're in. Um, so one, if you, once you identify what that challenge is, how do you go around it? Uh, so I've, I've seen a number of innovations in insurance where they're trying to come up with uh, pay-as-you-go solutions uh, for insurance. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I think my, my point of view, what, I, what I'm trying to say in terms of the most challenging part is what is the adoption rate going to be uh, by the consumer? And then also from a policy standpoint, are there regulations that limit the amount of innovation you could actually do uh, in that in that particular space? Thank you very much, Eric. Um, time flies when you're having fun. We've got about 10 minutes, but please, Maureen, jump in. Yeah, I would add on that and say, I, I like, like Eric may not be able to narrow down a specific industry or a specific vertical, but then I would encourage people to think about the broader or the enabling environment around your product or your business, whether you're a startup, an SME, or a, or a larger company. Um, for example, um, if, if you're doing something that's, that requires logistics, wherever you go, not just in, in Kenya, but on the continent, logistics is a challenge. It's a huge infrastructural issue. And, and so those are some of the things that, for example, if you want to innovate, tapping into, into that particular value chain and um, are building products that require some of these enabling environments, there are things that are worth considering right from the get-go to say, is, is this going to be an enabler or a detractor? And what is the level of effort required to overcome it in order to be successful within that particular vertical or industry? Yeah, thanks, Maureen. Um, this is what I like to call in terms of now free advertising. But uh, the question is, what are examples in Kenya or on the continent, let's put it that way then, of companies that have embraced the concept of innovate or die. You mean other than spindle design? Oh, <laughs> hey, well done. Good one, good well one. Well, 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 well played, well, well played, well played. <laughs> well out, well out, well out. Uh, I'm gonna ask all of you that, and uh, seeing as Maureen jumped in quickly, then please, Maureen, after you. <laughs> I, um, sorry, please ask the are question. You, okay, the you. question is, what are examples uh, in Kenya or on the continent uh, of companies that have embraced the concept of innovate or die, as in ones that spring to mind automatically and say, oh, okay, fine. Um, I, I think we, we talk about the M-Pesa Safaricom story a lot, which is one. And, and for all of the things that we can say that are good and, and bad about such a behemoth, they, it, Safaricom is one of those companies that tends to have at least... Uh, an attempt to innovate and release different products and tap into different markets. They've uh, tried to do different products in agriculture and education in health. Another company that comes to mind is Cedulant, um, who have really tried to build a brand and have strong roots within the ecosystem and are able to look across various industries and you know innovate, um, put out innovative products and innovate themselves as well in terms of their value proposition, additional services, even things like customer experience, right? It's, it's not just the big things that we see, it's also like those small touch points that our users or our customers are actually interacting with and being able to see different ways of improving the, that over time. Thanks, uh, Eric, uh, Ronald, uh, which one of you wants to jump in? I'm going to have to wrap it up very quickly, so I'm gonna have very yeah. quick answers. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I think spot on uh, uh, from Maureen uh, in terms of just responding to that question. So I will change the question a little bit so that I also get free advertising time. Oh, Is, for it. <laughs> it's not just about which companies have embraced, have embraced innovative AI, but it's also government. And today more and more, uh, people are, uh, 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 are making democratic uh, demands of governments to be more efficient because this is the primary responsibility of government, public service. How do you make public services more efficient so that people can be able to get them closer to them, can be able to get them cheaper, 
and that they can be able to turn around faster. So I think, you know, you look at, you know, the UK government, the Australian government, Estonian government is now almost entirely paperless. And on the continent, I mean, Kenya has not done bad by itself. You know, if you think about what Huduma and the innovation Huduma brought in public service, uh, Rwanda is going down that route as well. And so I think the questions governments need to be asking themselves as well, other than increasing taxes, you know, so that we can build more roads and, and more airports, is how do we make public service more efficient by leveraging technology, leveraging innovation to be able to serve our citizens better. And this is this is primarily what iGov does, working with the different ecosystem players to help government and its departments to think through developing innovation frameworks, but also bringing innovators, because a lot of innovators in the private space don't want to work with government. So being that bridge and saying, how do we build the bridge so that we can almost translate the language, the government language into innovation language, but also the innovators language into government. Into the government. Okay, That's a, yeah, that bridge needs to be built at some point. Huh? Yeah. And it's not one- Yeah, hoping I have the bridge. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now that makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, Eric, I'd ask you the same question in terms of examples of companies in Kenya or on the continent uh, who embrace the concept of uh, innovate or die. I mean, uh, just following uh, Ronald's cue, uh, since we have uh, four minutes. <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 what I would say is uh, going with an ecosystem play, I think, is really important. And that's one thing that uh, I believe Mastercard does uh, in a very strong way. Um, we, I've, I've talked about um, a startup program uh, which is called StartPath, where we actually support or bring in startups and support them. And we recently just completed the selection of a number of start, uh, startups in Africa. So we are working, again, we, uh, beyond just the, the traditional banking industry, uh, we are very keen and we, we are working very closely with uh, fintechs, uh, with telcos. And uh, so I, I believe MasterCard is also a, one, a player in the market or in Africa uh, and the, across the world that is really investing heavily in marketing. And that has been a big focus for us. And uh, I think uh, that, that, that people will see the impact on what we're doing. Uh, in, in the space of innovation. And that's one of the things the lab is uh, very focused on. Thanks, Eric. Um, quick fire then. Um, I just want to ask a question to our three panelists, our three guests. What innovative solutions do you personally feel Kenya is in dire needs of right now? Um, I'll go first, yeah. um, and, we are, and, we are, and this is not just talk, it's something we're already working on. I think we need um, we need we need a, a platform that formalizes our public service um, uh, space, public service sector, particularly Matatus. And so we are already developing an app called M Safari, uh, which is basically uh, primarily to help with building passenger manifests, so that there's order uh, building platforms for co for co customer complaints, uh, but also most importantly, cashless payments. Fantastic, uh, Maureen. Um, I, I would say um, one of the, the part of the, I would I would talk about a, a general solution or service and, and that is to um, I would say bridge the gap between private sector players and, and public service with, with some of the things like like what Ronald is doing in order to encourage those you know with the technical skills to marry those who have you know the greatest muscle to you know push infrastructure and that's government so I think Seeing that marriage work a bit better is something that I would definitely like to see, and it's a win-win for all. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, last but not least, Eric. Yeah, so, I mean, not that just, um, <clears throat> I think in Kenya, one thing that we really need to, or rather a solution that is quite is in terms of digitizing cash. And I don't say that just because I, I work in the financial services sector, <laughs> but the impact, <laughs> the impact of digitizing cash is so enormous in that it gives a transactional record of people's spend and it helps them get uh, financing. So when you're able to track or show uh, the how you spend your money, it enables them 
and then someone to get financing be it for their personal growth or for their business growth and yeah. uh, we have seen that the impact that gives and i think someone like trigger is a good example in terms of helping digitize that process and also mm -hmm. a product that we launched called jazaduka with uh, kcb uh, we are seeing in partnership with unilever uh, we are seeing the impact it is having on the distribution channel and that that is adding value so i think more solutions around digitizing cash uh, in whatever business uh, it is i think that will add a lot of value, value uh, for in, in kenya as well thanks so much eric um, eric we need we need to we need to have a tete -te to see how we <laughs> on um, so, and, and 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 mastercard before visa gets to us uh, <laughs> Most welcome, welcome. Welcome. Do, you want, do you want to collaborate with the boys as well of course I'll have it. <laughs> you're not left behind maureen you're welcome to the part <laughs> <laughs> see all is a gentleman all is a gentleman well done, guys. um what i'd like to do then is ask very briefly parting shots uh in terms of what we've done for the show innovation or anything you'd like to leave the viewers if that will inspire them wake up tomorrow morning and say this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do my inventive aspect, my creative aspect, and this is how I'm going to innovate. Uh, start with Maureen. I would say research, uh, test, iterate if you do not want to fail. Mm -hmm. Tried and tested. Short and sweet. Uh, Ronald. I would say. Um, <clears throat> You know, Kenya is now becoming a hotbed of innovation and uh, we're becoming known world over. So we're beginning to attract a lot of funding, uh, particularly for these innovations. But, and this has been, have gone viral a couple of weeks back, a lot of that money is still going to expat, expatriate founders. And our okay. biggest gap, and this is for people like Maureen, I guess, to help us with, our biggest gap is still our innovators, do not have an end-to-end -end visibility of their innovation, and we always crack or fall on the business case. So how do you build Eric? a business case? Eric? Um, I would say keep the, car, the person you're innovating for, or rather the consumer or customer at the center of it. Engage them constantly, uh, and just going back to what Maureen said, validate, uh, at every stage so that you're able to develop something that uh, will be accepted. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, so this evening, we've been having a chat with Eric, Ronald, and Maureen, and the conversation has been about innovation. I hope you've taken something out of it. I know I definitely have. Um, I've made three new friends as well, which is good. Martin, is there anything you want to add? And he's muted himself. We can't hear you. Murphy's law. Okay. Martin, we still can't hear you. Okay. How's that now? Something's happening. My computer's yep. just yep. updating, upgrading itself. I don't know, playing tricks on me. So that's Innov my part innovator, of innovator computer. Yeah. Innovation. Imagine the future and filling the gaps by Brian Halligan. And that that's the that's a good summary. Yeah, I like that. So thank you all. Thank you for <laughs> making time to come to our show. It's been lovely listening to all of you. Um I um I don't know. I, I don't know where to start and where to stop. It's just been very interesting. I'm still processing a lot. Um, I don't know if Ronnie is talking to us and the mic is off. Or... No, no, no. Oh. I was thinking. Ah, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, been a great show. Lovely having you guys here. And um, I think we have to have a round two and round three because, I mean, this is a topic which can go on and on. What do you think, Wawero? Uh, yeah, well, you know me. I'll sign me up. I think we'll, we'll next we'll we'll be looking into innovation and tying it into particular sectors, uh, focusing on sectors. And um, looking at the comments today, we've got. Um, I think Martin is having a problem with his machine, unless it's me. Yeah, we can hear him. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's one of the comments from Jackie Nakami. Maureen, I like the fact that many of us do not 
document what is oops. So um, any suggestions, uh, Maureen, on how we'll go about this? What we should do in terms of documentation? Am I clear? Is my mind? I, I, I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the point that Ronald mentioned, which is to, to make sure that we are um, essentially one of the things that we want to be able to do with innovation is tell our story. And we can't tell our story if we're not, uh, you know, capturing our learnings and documenting those, whether it's as simple as, you know, writing down what it is that you're, you're trying to achieve and what the results of, of that are. It doesn't take, take a lot. Um, so I, I I think those are just you know quick wins that any any person or any company trying to innovate uh, can do in order to make sure that they are capturing their learnings and uh, and keeping those focus right purposes. Okay, so I think that's a question answered, and um, yeah, with that I think we say good night to our viewers. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, the show is upload will be up on the our YouTube page. And um, see you guys next time. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening.